Hello and welcome to the show. It's me, John Park, and we are here for John Park's workshop. That's what's going on right here. Uh, thanks everyone for stopping by. And uh, when I say everyone, I'm talking about the people over in our YouTube and in our Discord. Of course, we're, we're uh, thankful if you're watching somewhere else and hope you're enjoying it. But if you're wondering where the discussion's going on, that's a good place to check out. You can go to adafruit.it slash discord and you'll get an immediate instant invite in to our uh, server. And then you can head over to the live broadcast chat channel. That's where uh, the discussions are going on. And hello over there in YouTube chat land as well. I can't check the, uh, the other ones. So if you're on Twitch or something and wondering, where are people? Uh, people are over here on Discord. So uh, let's see, what else have we got going on? Uh, we have a job board I should mention, and that is over at jobs.adafruit.com. You can check that out if you're looking for work or if you're looking to post your resume, if you're looking to hire someone. There are a bunch of interesting positions available here, some of them full-time, some of them part-time, some of them remote, some of them on-site, a whole array of things. Lead hacker, firmware engineer, director of the Schupf Family Idea Lab, Arduino code composite, manufacturing assistant, lots and lots of good stuff there over on jobs.adafruit.com. And all of it is vetted by PT and Lamore, so probably no scams in there, at least we hope. Uh, so go check that out over on jobs.adafruit.com. Other things that are happening in the world of making stuff. The Tuesday show I do is JP's product pick of the week. And that's a great show to check out if you want to see some demos of a new product pick and get a discount on it when it's available. And I'm, uh, again, going to apologize. This one sold out super quickly, so I know not, not too many people got them. Uh, but we... We know that, uh, that you understand with all these global supply parts shortages and things, it's not always possible to have as many of them as we would like. Uh, this week it was this one, the MCP 2317, or 23017, I should say, which is a 16-port I.O. expander. And the show is usually around 15 minutes long, but I like to make a little excerpt that's just a minute so you can see what was going on and check out the demo, and here it is. There it is, my very own the MCP23017 breakout board. This is a 16 I.O. expander, so you can do inputs and outputs. You can add up to 16 switches or buttons to your project. You can add up to 16 outputs, such as LEDs. It has the Stemma QT port. You'd simply plug that in, and all of a sudden, this little board that doesn't have that much I.O. built onto it grabs an extra 16 ports. You can see it. Underneath this board here, there's the MCP23017 with eight wires running to LEDs and resistors on the top row there, and eight wires running to these switches here. It's the MCP230117 16 IO expander. Yes, it is. Uh, and let's see what else is going on. There's a little section here I like to do called the Circuit Python Parsec. And you know what? That's coming right up. So let's get ready for it. Okay. Uh, hold on, I gotta pause the little video feedback on the side there because that's distracting. It's a five second later echo of me going on over there. Okay, uh, this looks like it's ready to go, yeah? I think it is. Okay, for the CircuitPython Parsec today, I want to show some more display I.O. stuff. This time it's going to be positioning. So when you create shapes inside of display I.O., a lot of their settings are fixed at creation time. But one thing that you can definitely do is change the position of an object. So here you can see I've got this little pill shape. This is actually a round rectangle. And I've set it up on this OLED feather wing so that I can use the A and C buttons to slide this left and right, move that around, kind of like a little paddle in Arkanoid or Breakout. And I can also hit the B button to reset it. And that just kind of centers it back, back there on the screen. 
Uh, this is actually pretty smooth in person. I know in video it's got a little bit of a lag, but what I want to do is show you how you can do this in code. So first of all, we're going to import some libraries, including the display IO library, and in this case, the display shapes round rectangle, as well as the driver for this display. Then I set up the display and I create this object right here. The round rect is a round rect and I position it at uh, zero and a particular height as well as a width and height of the object. I'm using um, some, I'm deriving those from the display itself. So this is somewhat portable code. And then I'm setting this to have a radius of eight around those corners. I fill it black and put a little white outline on it with a stroke of one. Then as I, in the main loop of the program, adjust buttons, we're simply changing the position. So I have a variable called xpos, and I'm either subtracting from it or adding to it. And then I'm updating the object with this line right here, round rect.x equals xpos. So as that x position changes, so does the position of the round rectangle. The uh, middle button here sets this to be one particular position, which is sort of the center of the screen and then the button on the right adds to it. And so that's a really simple way to use the X positioning on an object inside of Display.io to move things around. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. And uh, thank you, I was just checking in the chat and people said it, it uh, was looking pretty smooth on video. One thing I notice actually is my broadcast software when it doesn't have focus, but I still am seeing it as I'm over there in, in Adam changing stuff, it starts to, to glitch a little bit, but it's, uh, I'm glad to hear it's, it's smoothly, smoothly streaming, so that's nice. Um, the other question was about positioning and yeah, the, uh, the convention here with display IO is the top left corner is position zero, zero bring this back up here. Uh, so this upper left corner would be zero, zero. And in fact, let's, let's uh, take a look at adjusting some of this code a little bit, because that's, that's kind of a nice thing to see. Uh, so right now, in the creation of initially, I have it at zero on X, and then the height is uh, sort of halfway down. If I set that height to zero as well, and update that, you'll see now it's appearing in the upper left corner. Sorry about the glare there. Uh, if I get rid of the radius on this, I don't know if I can do radius of zero, I should be able to. Uh, it'll be a little more obvious that that corner, upper left corner of the shape is in the upper left corner of the display there. Um, and then, yeah, everything else is, is derived from that. So the uh, width of this one is a zero to 127. We can actually go off the edges of the screen. It doesn't uh, constrain you. You could, you could write code that does that, but now I'm, I'm still traveling. I'm, I'm over here by my, uh, by my other monitor at, by this point, and I can go, hey, there we are, we're back. And keep sliding back over left. And uh, as you can imagine, you could do multiple buttons. This is probably not fast enough to play a super fast video game, but uh, who knows? If Actually, if Foamy Guy is watching, uh, he's, he's a master of display I.O. So if you've got thoughts or tips and tricks, oh, he is here. In fact, I see him typing. Look, look this is fun. We've got a, a Tim sighting. Um, and let's see, Paul Cutler says, yeah, perfect timing for positioning. I need to learn this for a project. Well, good. There are a bunch of great resources, um, in learn system. If I pop over here, you will see this is a guide called UI quick start by Carter. And this has a page, uh, or rather the guide is circuit Python display support using display IO. This page is the UI quick start. This is a good place to, to go and get some information as well as look into some of the helper libraries. And this, this talks about some of those positioning things. Um, uh, Foamy guy noted it is worth, worth noting that the circle is uh, anchored at its center point. But I think most of, or if not all of the other shapes are, are at their sort of upper left corner. I don't know about triangle. I don't know where triangle is. Uh, is found. Maybe it's the, uh, the center of, of the object, who knows. Um, so yeah, so that's some, some cool display IO stuff. I might keep doing this. Let me know if you have any requests. Uh, 
in this, I'd like to sort of do a little series here doing display I.O. And this OLED is, is kind of a nice thing to do it with because you can just plonk that right on top of a feather or use these little feather doublers and you have a nice display. Uh, there's a lot of other great things like the Clue uh, or the Pi Portals or the Pi Gamer, Pi Badge. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of products that have some I.O built into them some buttons and things like that, as well as a screen, which is really fun for getting started with your graphic programming. Uh, and let's see, I think that covers it for that, that CircuitPython Parsec Extended Edition. Uh, oh, and C. Grover mentions vector IO is a bit faster for solid shapes. There's no outline yet. Uh, good note. Yeah, uh, C. Grover is another one who's done some really great stuff with UI work uh, and display IO work. So thank you. All right, uh, so let's get to a couple. I've got kind of a couple things going on with this week's project. So first of all, uh, if you recall the last couple weeks, I've been working on my telephone project. And one of the cool things about that project playing back sound files was using the audio mixer inside of CircuitPython to be able to adjust levels. And uh, one of the nice things about that is not only adjusting levels to sort of fade things in and out or balance things, but almost using it as a mute switch so that you can play a whole bunch of things and then just mute or unmute them as you need them. One of the reasons this is really cool is it's actually a bit difficult to precisely sync up multiple samples or multiple wave files, unless you start them all playing at the same time and then they're always in sync and then we can use muting and unmuting or the levels functions to bring those in and out. And so that's uh, one half of sort of one half of the things I'm going to be doing today. This is all based on some excellent stuff that Todd Bot, Todd Kurt, has been posting on his social media as well as his tips and tips, tips and tricks page on GitHub. Uh, and I'll, and I'll uh, point you there later over on uh, on Discord, or I'll call it up on here so you can see it. Uh, and so. There was one project that Todd was working on that was calling up samples, and some of those samples were looping using some break beats, uh, particularly the Amen break. And so uh, Lamore asked me, hey, why don't you do something with that? Why don't you do a project with that? So I'm going to start off at least. My prototypes I found really easy to do using the Neotrellis M4, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, we've got buttons. Two, we've got LEDs under those buttons. And three, we have audio output built right into it. So there's, uh, and it's a M4 chip, so there's actually a couple of analog outs. I'm using just the analog uh, zero out. I think this is mono that I'm doing. And uh, this has the circuitry on it to do a little bit of noise filtering. So it's an easy one to just plug into. What I may do, did I bring those in here? No, I didn't. What I may do is actually also develop this on the macro pad or even do a sort of custom project using some of our little snap apart uh, key switch PCBs and lighted, PC, uh, lighted key switches and, and, uh, and glow through key caps. So there's some places to go with this, but I think this is a really good platform for developing this. And uh, one thing I want to start off with is just a little bit of an explanation of what's, what's going on with breakbeats. Uh, if you've heard that term or if you haven't, uh, there were drum breaks in some funk songs in particular in the 60s. This one was uh, by the band called the Winstons called Amen Brother. And there was this break uh, that was just a really cool little drum fill, uh, sort, of, sort of not even a solo really. It's, it's more of a, a fill or a bridge with the drums. And uh, that's been sampled sort of tens of thousands of times at this point inside of music of all kinds. And it's a really familiar one. I don't think I can play it on here on its own without risking copy strikes, but you'll at least hear my sampled versions of it playing on here, but I'm not gonna just call up YouTube for that. Um, Gregory Coleman, by the way, is the, is the drummer who, who created this, uh, this fill or this break. And one thing that people like to do is take that, that sample and cut it up into little pieces and either uh, rearrange them uh, or mute and unmute them and fill other things in. So uh, both of the kind of prototypes that I've got going here make use of that and some other um, sort of synced 160 BPM uh, loops that'll, that'll work alongside of it. So uh, I think the second one I'll show 
will be running four loops that all are in sync together on four sort of tracks and then using these buttons to change the levels to mute and unmute just some sections of that. So that'll be one. The other one I'll do, actually I'll start with this one. I got to change the code on the board here to do this, is a, just a sample player uh, because I think this is a simpler starting point but with a couple little fancy tricks on it. So first thing I'm gonna do is fire this up and let me uh, switch to an overhead camera. Oops, not that one, not that one, that one. All right, and let me pull out here a little bit and we'll take a look at code in a minute, but let me just start off with uh, getting this going for for a bit of a example. So I'm gonna, actually I'll go to this view, why not? I'm gonna pull up different set of code on here. This will be the, that one, yeah? That one looks good. Okay, so let me save this to the board as code.py. What I'm doing here, by the way, um, you can't see my finder window coming up, but I'm, since I'm working with two related pieces of code here, I have them same, saved both to this uh, CircuitPy drive and uh, with unique names, and then I'll open one and resave it as code.py to, to show that or to work on that and, and then kind of store them here. I'm also storing it on a different disk since it's good to have some backups. Uh, but I'm saving the code I just opened as uh, code.py, replacing the existing code.py. So you'll see this is going to change here. And, and I'm, this one I'm using in kind of a vertical orientation. And let's zoom out just a little bit there. Fix that focus. And let me plug an audio cable into there. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to turn up. Uh... Okay, so you should be able to hear that. Let me know. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Let me know if any of those levels need to change, if you can't hear me or if you can't hear the, the drums and things. So what you'll see I've got here in this sort of prototype, this one is um, essentially just a one-shot player. So I've got some of these... 909 samples. We can play multiple notes at the same time. And these are just playing. These are, uh, I'm not doing any of the level stuff. So in this, this example here, I'm just playing or not playing and I start them from scratch. And that's all the ones I have in here. So I've got a couple of empty slots. Uh, the second column here is the break beats. So this first one is gonna be the Amen break. And you can hear it loops. Uh, now I've got variations on it. Now these ones, unlike these one shots, these are actually all playing all the time. And my button presses are just simply changing their level. So it's muting or unmuting them. And the reason that's cool is that all of them are in sync all the time. So if I hold one of these down and then bring up another one or switch between them, it should sound like we're, we're not creating a sort of train wreck of, of mismatched rhythms. So those are all in sync because they are exactly the same length, they're beat matched to begin with, and then they're just always running. Uh, these one shots can be added to that, but that's, that's on you, right? That's, that's on you to actually hit them at the right time. It requires rhythm. Uh, 
Uh, and so that's the, the use of these two, uh, let me turn that volume down for a second. That's the use of these two different types. So kind of a one shot versus a loop and using the play function in audio mixer or the, uh, the muting. So let's, let's take a look at how that works inside of code here. You can see on this one, I'm bringing in uh, some sort of typical expected stuff, time. Uh, I don't think I'm using the random function. That's just left over from the code I started from. Trellis M4, which gives us a bunch of convenience stuff for the buttons and the LEDs. Uh, it's similar in a lot of ways to keypad, which is why you can transfer this code fairly easily to something like the macro pad or anything that, that can use uh, the keypad as a, as a way of reading a, a large group of buttons. Uh, some lighting stuff, NeoPixel, supervisor for some timing stuff. And then the key here, I'm Im importing audio core, audio IO, which is gonna allow me to go audio out uh, on, the, on the DAC pin, and audio mixer. I'm setting up some key maps here of each of these coordinate positions, and that allows me to correlate a series of wave files uh, with which buttons being pressed as well as doing some lighting stuff. Uh, then we do a little light show at the beginning when it starts up, uh, some timing stuff. And then here's the wave file. So you can see right now, this is set up as these four columns of eight samples each. So there's that, uh, I can turn this back up, the kick, clap, snare, cymbal, closed hat, open hat, and then these two blank spaces are none and none. And then what you'll see after them here is a, uh, a second uh, piece of information, which is, are we gonna loop that or are we not gonna loop that? So these ones are one shots. They're gonna play when you press them and that's it. They don't try to loop, which is probably good because they're not particularly beat matched to loop inside of this 160 BPM that I'm using with all those other loop samples. You could do that, but in this case, it's not really necessary. These are just gonna play when you hit them and, and that's it. Uh, if we did do that, let's, let's take one that'll, that'll loop probably pretty well. Let's take the snare and I'm gonna set that to true, hit save. So that's the third uh, sample. So that's gonna be the third button down. So you can hear it's looping, but there's also a little bit of a empty tail a little blank space at the end there. So it's, uh, there's probably zero chance that's matched to this. You can hear, it's just kind of all over the place falling out of sync with that. Uh, so that's how these are being designated as one shots versus this second column here, uh, as well as the first button on the third column. Those are playing wave files just the same, except these are set to loop true which means once, they're, once they hit play, they just play forever. And then I have a bunch of empty spaces that could be filled in with other samples here. Um, then I'm doing a little bit of a, a color fill, uh, setting up the audio mixer, and this is set to have the number of voices, because the audio mixer, you can just think of it as like a big mixing console. It has however many voices in it as you designate. I don't know what the upper limits are. This is gonna be a memory constraint at some point, but right now we have uh, you know, almost 16 voices going on in here because of the, the number of samples that are, that are in here. Um, I'm presuming we could go all the way to 64 on this, which is, uh, which is our number of buttons, right? Um, is that right or is that 32, 32? So then uh, once the mixer object is started, uh, it's, it's playing and it's ready to play any of those that uh, have a wave start and have their sample um, uh, volume level go up. And then there are these two functions here that are used for handling the different types of samples that we can play. So for the one shots, I have this function handle sample and then which sample number, and if it's been pressed, then the voice is whichever voice number correlates to that. So we set that, that we tell the uh, audio IO mixer that we're using that voice, let's say voice three right now to play this. Uh, if it's pressed, the wave file is opened, and then it loops if it's set to loop. If not, 
it, it is going to stop when you release. Um, so that's the one shots. And, and by the way, some of this, I said this is prototype code, stuff I've been working on this morning and, and chatting with Todd about and uh, sort of wrestling his code into, into slightly uh, esoteric uses he didn't intend initially. So there's some stuff in here that's not necessary since these, these ones actually right now I'm setting to use the handle sample only on ones that don't loop. Uh, then what I'm doing is opening and playing all of the ones that do loop. So these are 8 through 17, these buttons here. Those, I just open them all up and I set them playing and I set their level to zero. If we set this to one to begin with, uh, we should hear a lot of noise when this starts up. Let's see. So they're all playing right now. We can stop them in this case by, uh, by hitting all the buttons. But we don't want that. We want that to start at zero. And then here's how I am uh, unmuting them. So that's with this handle mixer. And I have the number of whichever voice. If it's pressed, the level goes to one. If it's released, the level goes to zero. So it's, it's very simple. Again, there's some leftover stuff. I don't need to arguments going into this function here. That's just leftover cruft. Uh, then there's some timing stuff set up with millis and the supervisor ticks in milliseconds. The uh, scaling of the volume allows us to work in integers so that we don't give it uh, sort of decimal float numbers. Uh, we fill the uh, pixels up with this blue color once it's sort of ready to, ready to go. And then we hit the main loop of the program. Here we watch for pressed keys. So this is a trellis function, uh, similar to event, uh, get event inside of keypad. And this creates a set, kind of a list of which keys are pressed. So it, so it knows all the pressed ones and it can do things with those. Again, that's kind of a convenience function of how um, the trellis works, trellis library works. For those that are pressed, we're going to set the color. I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just picking a, this sort of magenta color here. Uh, then when they, when they are pressed, we take the pressed keys and check which um, sample number they are so we know which, which, um, which one to pull up as well as which key to light up. Uh, if the sample number is less than eight, we use this handle sample. So that's all these one shots here. If it's greater than eight, that's the rest of these. And we use the handle mixer, which brings the volume back up. Uh, and then when it's released, we kind of do the opposite. We change the color back and we, we mute the, the sample or stop playing the, uh, the one shot. Again, that's only necessary if they're looping, which they're not right now. So that was the, the kind of first version of it. And then uh, let me see if there's any questions in here. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, cool. So let's now, um, let's jump over actually to, to the bench over here. I got to set up a, a little audio thing, but I want to show um, on, a, on a pretty advanced piece of gear what this sort of uh, sample chopping can do. And then we'll do our uh, sort of simplified version of that on our um, trellis with the other code that I've got. Let me switch this, this camera here. That's the one I meant. Okay, so I need to grab a powered speaker for this. Let's try this little red radio. Let's see if this one will work. This one has kind of a noisy audio connection, but we'll see if I can get that working. How about that there? And before I forget, let me um, bring up my Discord on the phone so I can see if anyone's telling me I've done something weird. So, here we are. And there's the live broadcast. All right. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. Okay, let's grab an audio cable. 
Wow, I don't have many audio cables over here right now. Are you one? Nope. That's a funny one. Let's, uh, steal one from over here. All right, let's see how that does. <coughs> okay, so you should be able to hear that. Uh, so this is the, uh, you've seen me bring this out before. I love this gizmo. This is sort of a desktop sampling workstation. It's called the Black Box from 1010 Music. And it is, uh, among other things, really good at dealing with sample slicing. So if we take a look, um, let's use, well, let's use the, the Amon break here for, uh, to, to sort of keep apples to apples. So if we look at a cell here on this, I can load a sample. So this is pretty similar to how the Trellis works. We're loading up a wave file. Uh, so I will go into my big folder of break beats and see the Winston's Amen Brother load that. Okay, so there's the file actually here. Hopefully we get away with playing this. This is uh, leading up into and out of the break, so you can hear what it started life as. Oh, we can't. Why is that not playing? Did this lose power? I think this battery died. There we go. All right, I'll stop that there. Uh, so now if you look at uh, this as a series of slices, we can go in and let's say, I gotta remember how to slice it on a grid or scan it. Let's scan it. This won't be perfect, but what this is gonna do is it's gonna try to find the sort of transients where it gets loud and quiet. And, and slice those into little individual sections. If I, let's go, turn that up again. So this is just one little slice of that. Okay, so you get the idea. Uh, and on here we can even, take that set of slices and play them individually. Um, okay, and so what that allows you to do is either rearrange those to place different sounds in the original spaces, um, or do this sort of muting and, and playing thing that uh, that we're gonna look at. If, if you look at one other example on here, just because I already made something with one of these, uh, there's, a, there's a James Brown. So that's a, ain't it funky now, but I'm really messing around with, with the timing of things. Uh, so, so what we'll do with the trellis is somewhat similar to this, and this was uh, another excellent Todd Kurt idea, uh, which is to take these samples, have them all playing, and then be able to mute them and unmute them. So what I'll do is open up this other bit of code here, uh, which is the beat slicer. And I'm gonna resave that to the trellis as code.py, replace yes. Uh, this one is horizontally oriented here, so we'll flip our cables around. C. Grover for the sharp eyed, you may notice a little white dot on that cable. So, what's happening now on this one is we've got four samples that I've loaded in, they're all playing, and then they're actually 
16 steps long, so this is kind of a loop, but we can use eight buttons wide, just because of how the hardware is laid out. We can use eight buttons to decide if step, uh, the first step, or the first step of the, the second section are gonna be muted or unmuted. So let's start with that amen break. So you can hear now it's just skipping every other because it's muting it out. Now let's see what we have on another track. So it's like a drum and bass loop. Okay, very different feel, but beat matched. And so now what you can do is start to mix and match. And then I also took, uh, sometimes it's fun to add a vocal into there that doesn't necessarily have to uh, fit rhythmically or musically. It can kind of ride along at a different tempo. So here I've got a vocal you'll recognize if you watched the live stream last night, Ask an Engineer. Uh, let's, let's bring in some uh, rhythm to accompany it first. All right, so that's a little clip of uh, the retro tech section from the show last night with Phil and Lamore. Got a cool, uh, cool sounding sample from, from them. Uh, so let's take a look at this one, how this is working. We've got, uh, you can see the code here. Uh, we're bringing in simple stuff, time board, audio core, audio mixer, audio IO to send out over pin A0 there, and then the Trellis M4. Do a little bit of sleep at the beginning to let USB settle down, especially when you're doing audio stuff. Sometimes it can, it can make noise at you, so uh, it's good to put a little sleep at the beginning there when it starts up. Then I'm picking my uh, WAV files that I'm using, and I also actually had a different one in here. Um, if I resave this, you'll hear here's a kind of a cool... Nice if I had a special uh, Vulcan grip, like all four corners to mute them all. Uh, so that's the list there, loop files, is the list of WAV files that are just sitting on the disk. And they're pretty small. Uh, they're they're uh, 22K, 16-bit uh, mono files. And you could probably make them even smaller if you needed to. Uh, then we have the number of loops that there are, which is the length of that loop files there. So there's four. And then the number of slices is how many of these mute slices that we have going horizontally with the buttons. Beats per minute here is 160, and that's derived from the samples. So we're really starting from some samples. You can use audio uh, processing software to adjust that to get it to where you want, but then we're not stretching that stuff in real time. We're just reading it off the disk really fast, which is, which is what makes this all possible. And so we want our little mute steps to go along in time with that. Uh, <clears throat> then we set up the trellis, and I'm setting brightness pretty low just so you can see it on the, on the screen here. The audio I.O. is set to go out on pin A0. Mixer is set up again with, uh, in this case, four voices, so voice counts equal to the number of loops. Audio mixer uh, is attached to audio playback. The drum loops all start essentially at the same exact time here, so for I in range number of loops, 
we open each wave, we set it to its respective voice, and then we set its, its uh, level at zero. So they're playing, but volume is down. Um, do some uh, stuff with millis uh, so that we can clock our little uh, mute steps there and, and run that little light across there. And then the main uh, loop here, we're again checking for uh, this, creating this set of keys that are pressed, so it keeps in mind which ones are pressed. Uh, when I press one, I am checking the XY coordinate. So this, in this case, with this orientation, this is button 0, 0, 0, 1, no, 0, 0, is it XY? I think it is. 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, and so on. Uh, row 1, row 2, row 3, so 0, 1, 2, and 3 uh, of rows and seven, 0 through 7 for columns. Uh, so with those in, uh, in mind, we know exactly which uh, sample we're dealing with, which voice, because it's the uh, second number there, the Y, and which mute segment we're on because it's the X. Uh, we check if something is playing there, then for each of those beats, we uh, move along and set the volume to either be fully up or have it to 0.8 or fully down, depending on if one of those buttons are pressed. So, so we can run through and check each of those X uh, buttons as we, as we move along in time. Um, let's see. What else? I was just distracted. Todd said, by the way, all of these samples, except for Amen Break, are from freesound.org. Um, yeah, and I don't know if anyone's getting in trouble at this point for using Amen Break. It's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated situation as far as uh, the Winstons never getting royalties for the tens of thousands of times it's been used. But sorry, guys. Uh, then let's see for each of those. Uh, we go through and set the lit color or the pressed color or the unlit color rather. Uh, and then the beat marker sets it to this. So if we want to change colors here, actually I did this on one, one version of mine. Um, we can do, let's say, a blue color. And this way you have, it's kind of nice so you know when it starts up that it's, uh, that it's actually started up. Oh, now I've done it. Sometimes this will need a reset. I was pushing it. I should have just let it play. There we go. So, oh, now I've, yeah, I've, I've angered it again. Let me hit reset on here. I broke the reset button on this one, so it's, it's just the little copper nub now, so I don't like to press that one too much. There we go. Um, That's kind of a whiplash to go to that little slower sample there, or that mellower sample. Um, and so, let's see. Yeah, that about covers uh, these two sort of prototypes. Let me know what you think in the comments uh, or over on the Discord chat. I am going to refine these a bit and then think about either... Uh, let me know what you think about hardware if, you, if you'd like to just see this on this. It's, it's kind of perfect. There's, there's nothing to build. It's a software... Uh, pretty much a software-only project, which I like, and uh, we have these. We have these in stock. You can get the kit. Um, in fact, let's let's jump over to that. I'll show you what what I'm running here. If you're not familiar with it, this was uh, in an Ada box a couple years ago now, so I know a lot of people got them. Uh, let's go to Ada Fruit, and this one is called the Neo Trellis M4. Uh, there's a bare one or the kit, which you probably want, uh, which includes the uh, elastomer buttons and the acrylic case and the screws you need. Um, I left some laser cut paper, brown paper on there. <laughs> so it doesn't usually look like that. You usually see the black through. Um, so these, yeah, it's a, we have some of these in stock and they're 60 bucks. Uh, there's a lot of projects for these in our, in our learn system, but I thought this would be a cool one to do because it's, um, beyond just a soundboard, which is very cool, 
This one is more of a um, sort of sequencer, sample, sample playback thing, and it uses audio mixer, which is very cool uh, how well that, that works for us. So. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Otherwise, options are kind of any of our keyboard types of things, macro pad, our standalone, uh, what are they called? The, let's go to keyboards. We have a category now. If you go into, oh no, that's under Raspberry Pi. Uh, let's go to macro pad. I think that's in that category. Mechanical keyboards. So if you head here, um, I think under development boards, we'll probably see this one here, this five by six snap apart. So you can kind of rearrange that into anything. This one might be a cool one to, to rearrange into some 16 beat wide things, uh, but you know, that's a whole, a whole different level of, of uh, fabricating your project and, and it's kind of nice uh, on this one. But this would definitely work on macro pad as well. Uh, and the main thing to add there is just a audio uh, out via the stem QT because the, the macro pad, kind of the only, audio, only output on the macro pad is that stem QT uh, cable on the side of it right there. So you can take that over and instead of sending I squared C stuff over the SCA or the serial data, you could, SCL or serial data, you could send uh, PWM audio, I think. But this one works well, so maybe we'll, we'll keep, this, uh, keep this as an M4. Um, yeah, Todd mentions Trellis M4 is also really good as a macro pad. It is for sure. Um, all right. Well, I think that's going to do it. Thank you, uh, everyone, for stopping by for this. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed getting your, uh, your fill of some breakbeats for the day. And I will be uh, hanging around in the Discord for a little bit as I finish up documenting and writing the phone, uh, the, the dial-a-song guide. I've got a bunch of photos to, to process and put into the guide there. And uh, so I'll be around. So hit me up if you have any questions. Otherwise, that's going to do it for another episode of JP's Product Pick of the Week. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Bye. <laughs>